welcome back to another episode of Millennium Live. I'm Connor Tu, and I'm the host of the Millennium Live podcast series. And we're happy to be joined by one of our great partners here. We have Validic. And to talk all about Validic today and the healthcare system as a whole and revolutionizing and igniting a digital health revolution is Drew Schiller. He is the CEO and co-founder of Validic. Drew, great to have you back on Millennium Live. I know it's been a minute since you've been uh, on the podcast, but uh, a lot has happened since COVID, and and it's great to it's great to have you back on the podcast to talk healthcare. Awesome, yeah, glad to be here. Great, so let's let's dive into it. I know you talk a lot about personalized care, and I want to start right there. So, could you explain to our audience perhaps? the idea of personalized care and what that means for patients and consumers as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This, this con this term came up as we were thinking about what's sort of happened more broadly for us as consumers. So everything around us is personalized these days, right? Everything we watch, you know, on Netflix, et cetera, everything we buy, like when we go to the Amazon app, even, you know, our, our Starbucks order, um, you know, stores reminding us that it might be time for us to you know, buy more paper towels, things like that. Like we are constantly surrounded by personalized experiences. Um, and most of us expect that. In fact, McKinsey has a stat that 71% of consumers expect those personalized experiences. Um, and we actually get really frustrated when we don't receive personalized experiences from companies. Um, and uh, we were actually looking at um, the stats around that, which is that 76% of of uh, consumers are frustrated when they don't receive a personalized experience. And we noticed that, in fact, uh, there's data from the AHIMA Foundation that says that 76% of patients are frustrated when they're leaving healthcare appointments. We thought, well, that's an interesting correlation. I wonder, what, <laughs> I wonder what's there. And it turns out that when you start to really look into the reasons of why patients are frustrated, um, in their medical appointments, they they don't feel like they leave, like they, they don't they don't feel like they got their questions answered. Um, they don't feel like they were fully listened to. Um, they feel like they need to go and, you know, they didn't fully understand what the appointment was about. And so they need to go and Google it, right. And like figure out, like do some more online research. And so they're not receiving personalized attention or personalized care from their healthcare providers. And what we've known for a long time at Validic, because we bring in data from personal health apps and devices, and we bring it into the clinical workflow so that clinicians can understand what's happening in people's daily lives. We recognize, we've known for a long time that that having that data at the point of care creates uh, a conversation between the healthcare provider and the patient where the healthcare provider is now talking about what's actually happening in that person's daily life and what behavior changes they can make in a tailored way. Um, and we notice, you know, hey, that is a personalized interaction. Like that is personalized care. And that's what that, you know, that's what we want as consumers, but it's also how we want to be seen as patients. And so um, that's really what we mean is just being able to help patients and, uh, and their care providers have a better conversation that's ultimately more personalized and tailored to the patient's needs, while also not providing more work um, on the healthcare provider, because that's, that's a non-starter, right? <laughs> Yeah, of course, which is actually what I want to ask you next. I know, I mean, it's great to have this personalization and to have that data actionable enough to improve the human life, but this could require some one or more things to do on the provider side. So, you know, and then of course, that's not what providers need today and in, in their bogged down schedules. So how do you manage your client's workload and, and how do you take that off their shoulders and provide that that solution for healthcare providers today. Yeah, totally. So if you think about like a typical uh, interaction with a, a in a primary care type of environment, or even even maybe a specialty clinic, um, the patient comes in and um, they the first thing that they do is they try to communicate their problems, like what's going on to the nurse. And the nurse is asking a million questions and just trying to understand everything from the patient's perspective, everything the patient remembers, like what's happened since the last time they were seen. And then the physician comes in and, you know, has like glances at the nurse's notes, right? And then asks a lot of the same questions to the patient. 
sometimes there's things that a patient will tell the physician that they didn't tell the nurse because they forgot or you know whatever else. Um, and it ends up being like, there's different information being delivered to the nurse than to the physician. And like the physician's honestly just trying to quickly address the, the concern that the patient have and just hasn't just move on. So it's like a really disjointed experience for everybody. And that's, I think, why patients are leaving feeling frustrated. In the personalized care model, what happens is we actually bring the data into the clinical workflow that from people's daily lives. And so, and I'm going to explain um, how that happens. Like, in, uh, think about it in the same way that um, a nurse would, uh, or a physician would order a lab. So they would go to a patient's chart, they'd, they would order a lab, they'd select the lab they want, the sample would go to the lab for processing and be, the results would be sent up to the provider in their secure, via secure message, like they're in basket. And the provider could review it and type clinic notes in and have a conversation with the patient about it. So we enable that same workflow for personal health data, um, where the data, the like patient is enrolled in the program in the clinical chart. And then the, the data is just a visually there for the um, healthcare team to review um, for that particular patient. So in a personalized care model, contrasting that first experience with an appointment, the patient comes in, the data is already in the EHR. So now instead of trying to pull all this information from the patient and figure out what's happened since the last time they saw each other, the nurse can just say, hey, this is what I'm seeing. Um, and like anything else you'd like me to know, or can I ask you some questions about this, right? And so they can fill, fill in a little bit of the gaps, but they have a baseline understanding. And then the, the physician can come in and already see the same data and says, hey, so this is what I'm seeing. And I understand from the nurse X, Y, and Z. Great. Now I can provide tailored behavior guidance to that patient based on the data that we all see and know. And so now the patient knows, okay, so this is my factual data. This is the behavior change I need to make because of it. And so they leave feeling like they're part of the care team. They feel seen. Um, they feel like, you know, they understand what they need to do. So it's not actually changing anything about what the workflow is for the nurse and the physician. It's actually just streamlining how they're getting the data and improving the conversation. Hmm. So bringing in that data for providers uh, to examine, it, it sort of feels like remote patient monitoring. Uh, yeah. So so what's that? What's the difference? And what, what's the difference between the remote patient monitoring? And I know you touched upon it a little bit, but that personalized care that we're talking about that Valida can bring. Totally. Yeah. So uh, the difference is, so remote patient monitoring, so two things. One is, it's a bit of a subsection of personalized care. So, so remote patient monitoring is a capability of what we deliver with personalized care. So for example, in the clinical workflow, if there are any clinically actionable alerts um, that should be surfaced up for a patient, for example, in a heart failure program, those alerts get surfaced up in the uh, in this via secure message in the EHR, so via the in basket or via in basket pool, for example, for the care team to recognize and respond to, um, and then reach out to the patient and have a conversation to prevent you know a hospital readmission and help the patient on their heart health journey, et cetera. So um, so that monitoring piece is definitely part of the personalized care, but um, there are some people who don't necessarily need monitoring where personalized care is actually still very, very effective for them um, as patients. So for example, take somebody who has, who's like newly diagnosed for hypertension um, for the first, you know, three, four months until they get their medication locked in, especially if they're more on the high risk spectrum of hypertension, you probably want to have them in a monitoring program, right? You want them to have their BP cuff. You want alerts surfaced for a period of time. Once that patient has their meds locked in um, and they're they're managing well with their condition, you probably don't need to monitor. You don't need those alerts to fire anymore, but you would still like the data to be available in the patient's chart when that patient comes back in. And so in that instance, it's not remote patient monitoring, right? It's just providing better data to have a better conversation, right? It's just personalizing the care experience. And so that's why that's why we call it personalized care. It's part of a whole comprehensive strategy where people are not just like one disease state for one time. Like they're a whole person and need different levels of care at different times. And our solution allows uh, clinicians to basically be able to provide the right levels of care um, for patients at the right time with the right interventions so they can deliver better outcomes. Of course, I mean, powering outcomes and engagement. 
and insights. I, I love everything that Valetic does. And you, obviously, you've been a great partner with Millennium for a while. So I just wanted to give you a nice shout out there. But um, let's talk challenges. You know, what challenges can personalized care address on on both this patient side as well as the provider level? Yeah, absolutely. So so at the provider level, one of the big challenges is the revenue model. Like um, a big challenge with remote, any sort of remote care programs or any virtual program um, is that it's really difficult sometimes for health systems to find a path for these programs to be fiscally sustainable and scalable. Um, and so one of the things that we've thought long and hard about is like, how can we set up um, the revenue model, understanding that we live in the real world, um, where, you know, health systems aren't paying for someone to be healthier, which then creates fewer billable events, right? Like that's, <laughs> like, that's the dirty little secret about these programs is that, like, health systems want to do it, but they can't, they can't lose money hand over fist on it. Um, and so we thought really long and hard about that. And effectively, what we've done is created a really cost balanced way um, for these programs to be put in place where um, if somebody is sort of at a low risk and not being seen very much, um, it's actually really low cost programs, whereas as they sort of as patients increase um, in need and and in risk level, um, and therefore in the number of billable events, etc, there's actually um, with additional services that Validic provides, there are additional um, fees associated with that. So it sort of is a cost balanced solution um, that scales based on the level of care. Um, so that's that's a big thing that we do. And the other thing is you, you asked how um, how this helps patients. Um, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a story. So uh, we actually work with um, or have worked with a, a patient um, advocate. His name is Steve Van. Um, and I have permission to share his name. Um, and he's, he's a great person. And Steve actually went through, uh, one of our, uh, early programs, um, back in 2016, um, with a health system where we were bringing data into clinical workflow. And the way we got introduced to Steve is that he was, uh, actually, um, he, he had uncontrolled diabetes for over a decade and he was, he was going to a PCP, you know, every quarter and he would show up and his PCP would say, Steve, your A1C is still way out of whack. It was over nine. And, you know, you got to eat healthier and you got to exercise more. And Steve's like, doc, I am trying, like, I don't know what more to do. And he was gaining weight and he, he was just really, really unhappy in his life. Right. And nothing he was doing was working. Um, and he would show his doctor, his glucose readings on his phone. He'd be like, here's my glucose readings, doc. Like, can you tell me what to do with this? And his doc's like, I, I don't know what to do with that, but I'm telling you it's not working. Right. <laughs> like you got to do more. So Steve left and he went to this other health system um, that we we're working with and got enrolled into this diabetes management program where his the data from his glucose meter was brought in, connected up and brought into the EHR. Um, and in Steve's second appointment, because the data was already there, um, the nurse uh, looked at the data and said, hey, Steve, um, I see here in the chart that you're tracking your glucose um, readings really regularly. Um, and then we also provide a view where we're, we graph the glucose readings over a 24 hour point period of time. So it's really easy to see how well people are tracking at certain times a day and sort of where those levels come in. And so the nurse was able to see that he was tracking really well at certain times a day and it was all normal levels of glucose, except in the evenings. And there was a spike. And so the nurse said, Hey, Steve, what's going on here in the evenings? And Steve was like, oh, well, you know, I'm having a snack with my, uh, but don't worry, healthy snacks with my wife as I'm watching movies. And it, he, he was eating un, unbuttered, unsalted popcorn. He thought that was healthy. So when the doctor said you need to eat healthier, he thought he was eating healthy. It turns out the nurse was like, no, Steve, that's not good for you. Like cut that out and see what happens. So he eliminated that. And within 30 days, his A1C dropped by half a point. Um, it was the first time he had ever had that sort of experience. And that led to a series of conversations over the years where he's just, he's going in, he's got the data. He knows that his doctors see the data and they're talking. He's like, now what's going on here? Help me figure out like, how can I change my behavior to address this? And slowly over time, he's worked his A1C down to where it's below six. He's lost 50 pounds. He's organic gardening. He's swimming daily. Like he's, he's a very, very healthy person. And just a few years ago, he was extremely sick. 
Um, and so like the, the way that this helps patients and physicians is that, or patients and clinicians is that it just helps them have a different conversation. Like there's no way that that conversation and health outcomes ever could have been had if it wasn't for having the data in the clinical cl clinical record. Cause Steve already had the glucose readings. Like he already was trying to eat healthy and exercise, right? Like he was already doing all, like the only thing that changed was the availability of the data in a way that enabled clinicians to, to interpret it better. I mean, that's, that's a great story. Thanks for sharing that, Drew. And what a, what a great example of uh, a measurable outcome that um, you've seen in, in, in terms of prioritizing this data-driven patient care. I, I loved it. I love to hear it. And, and way to go, Steve. Yeah. So, so of course, not everyone can be a Steve. And 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 what in terms of what you've seen so far, what about those patients who won't engage with these programs who protect, you know, potentially don't see the value or haven't enrolled in something like this? Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, uh, no, no, pay, no program ever is going to get 100% participation. So I'm just going to like name it and own it and like, <laughs> like, it's impossible. So like, just just to be really clear. Um, what we do see, though, uh, is that uh, the vast majority of people who are enrolled in these programs do end up actually um, completing the enrollment um, uh, and actually starting in the program. And three quarters of people who are enrolled in these programs are still recording readings at least twice a day after 90 days. So it's really sticky. Like for the people who participate, it's really sticky. The, and that that same group uh, also um, three quarters of people also feel like they're receiving better care, which I think is one of the reasons why they're still recording the readings. And over half of those patients feel um, like they're um, better able to self manage their condition. And so, um, so that's the that's the positive side of this. Now, the really interesting thing about the question you asked around what about the patients who won't engage? And my acknowledgement, we're never going to get hundred percent engagement. So we're always going to try to get as many people as we can, but the benefit of the fact that the people who do enroll in these programs, they love it. They better self-manage. They have real measurable clinical outcomes um, in, you know, just six to nine weeks. Um, the benefit of that is that it enables clinicians to actually spend more time with the patients who aren't engaging in the programs and understand that everybody else is doing okay. Right. Cause you, you have access to the data, you see it. So, you know, that like, you're not doing those other patients a disservice by paying attention to the folks that won't engage. You're actually now just, you can spend more time with the folks who won't engage the end also know that everybody else is doing okay. Hmm. So it, I mean, it works in theory, right? It's the, the healthcare system really isn't set up uh, you know, to pay for programs like this at scale. So, you know, how does this work for, dare I say, is this a fee for service environment? How does it work in, in such an environment like that? And is it sustainable? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll go back again to, um, we, we talked with so many health system executives and they always say, look, um, we want to scale these programs because it um, leads to better patient outcomes, um, better, uh, better patient satisfaction, um, clinicians like the programs, um, but at the end of the day, we can't spend money to have fewer billable events. And so in the fee-for-service world, this is this is a particular challenge. So when, when I talk to these folks, what they always tell me is, look, we don't need these programs to be wildly profitable, but they because they do have all these other benefits, but they they need to, um, but they can't be a huge loss. Like we have to at least have a path to break even, right? And so the way that we've really structured our system and being this cost balanced solution is that there are other benefits of these programs where if we can come in and be a cost neutral, um, like a, a neutral cost center um, for these organizations, there are so many other benefits that we provide because um, we provide, you know, better patient satisfaction scores, better clinical outcomes, our heart failure programs reduce it, reduce readmissions. Um, we have, uh, because we're built into the clinical workflow, nine out of 10 clinicians actually say our program saves them time. So you think about like clinician burnout and the amount of time that they're spending with patients, like our technology is actually proven to help them have more effective and efficient um, uh, conversations with the with patients. So they actually have um, more time to do the things that they want. 
Um, and so they are, they are able to just provide better care, which is really, you know, a key driver for them to not feel burned out. Um, we also have seen a, a 63% decrease in the amount of time that clinicians spend on the phone with patients. So from 15 minutes down to five and a half minutes on average. And so you want to talk about like, you know, overburdened, overworked workforce where we just can't hire enough workers. You know, when a patient calls in with a concern, think about the nurse, like addressing, like talking to the patient and addressing what they have to say and not knowing anything about why they're calling and having to ask all these questions versus having all of the data that's happened with that patient right then and there and being able to have a real conversation with that patient and say, okay, I'm seeing what's going on. Like, let's try to do this or let's schedule an appointment for you to come in or, you know, whatever the case may be, but you can jump immediately to, to a problem solving because you have access to the data. So um, it's, it is challenging in a fee for service world. One thing that's encouraging for us is that um, most of the clients that we're working with have some balance of risk, right? So um, they have some population in an MA plan or MSSP program um, or something. We're seeing more and more of these or hybrid organizations where there's um, some level of risk inside of the health system. Um, and so they're thinking about, well, how can I set up a program that works for both, right? <laughs> like both fee-for-service and risk. And um, what we do know is that the, the PMPM model is standard in place for um, like remote patient monitoring programs does not work really well for either of those. Um, but the the sort of personalized click care, like only pay for what you need model, <laughs> which is really what we built. Um, uh, that's, that is very much a model that seems to be working fiscally well for our clients. Yeah. So, I mean, Drew, this is a, a great conversation. Uh, you're a great partner, but, um, you know, I, I like to always end millennium live with a future question. Uh, you know, you have so much experience with this, you know, you're on the a board chair of the CTA, which is the consumer technology association and health division, a uh, member of the CTA executive board, you're contributing to advancing the industry through CTA policy and efforts. And you also serve as an executive committee board member uh, for the North Carolina Council for Entrepreneurial Development. You are a fa the co-founder of Validic uh, over 12 years ago. And, uh, you know, you are leading the digital health platform for personalized health data. So, where do you see all this going? What excites you the most about the future of personalized care, Drew? Where where do we start? Where where is this going? I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And I'll just say, you know, if we really take a step back, um, we have a, a situation where we have more people who need more care. You know, more people are turning 65 all the time and we're living longer. Um, and that's great, right? My, my own grandparents are 92 years old and they live in their home and they're, they're, um, yeah, and they're, they're doing, they're doing as well as can be expected for 92, right? They're, they're, they're overall very healthy and that's fantastic. It also, they are also big healthcare utilizers, right? Because, because yeah. they're in their nineties. Um, and so we have more and more people who are aging into that into that level. And so we just have more people who need more care. Um, and we also know that we have fewer healthcare workers to deliver that care. So you know, 47% of healthcare workers are expected to leave their positions by 2025. It's a it's a big challenge that we have with our workforce and ability to um and ability to retain talent there um because of workout or uh, sorry, because of burnout, because of um, you know, how, how difficult things have been for them for the last few years. So the big opportunity I see, um, when you have more people who need more care and fewer people to deliver it is through, uh, technology that can actually help healthcare providers understand who needs care today, who's doing well today and help them prioritize, you know, cause most of their help them prioritize their, their efforts. Cause most of healthcare providers day to day is just spent sort of like next person up. Like imagine, you know, if you in your work calendar never had the opportunity to review it until you showed up the, that morning of and you were like, well, here's my day and it's back-to-back -back meetings and I'm fully stacked and like 
I have no idea who each of these persons are, but I'm going to talk to all of them. Like it's a really difficult, like it's a really <laughs> difficult setup, right? And and that's kind of where they're at. So I, I see an opportunity to to, to switch to a model um, over time as we start to develop this per these personalized care programs where we can really start to prioritize um, our the who we're delivering care and how we're delivering care um, based on what's actually happening in their daily lives and know that everybody else is doing okay. Bro, thank you so much. That was a that was a great conversation. I, I let's let's have you on every year to to talk about uh, healthcare innovation and transformation, especially trying to assemble the uh, world's most sophisticated health data platform. It's great to talk to you. I know we have a healthcare providers and payers transformation assembly provided by the Millennium Alliance coming up in June. Uh, looking forward to to hearing your thoughts and and continuing the conversation. Uh, please, uh, this has been. Um, we need to talk more about healthcare and 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 the and the impacts that uh, that solutions and technology can provide in the system. So, thanks for sharing your thoughts as always, and uh, hope to see you soon. Yeah, likewise, absolutely. Thanks for having me.